Hello, everyone. It's gear week in the Los Angeles photojournalism meetup group. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about gear this week. Um, that's probably the topic that we need a video on the least because there are so many gear channels on YouTube. Um, YouTube is filled with people who do detailed, in-depth gear reviews, compare and contrast, all of it. Interestingly, there aren't really photojournalism channels on YouTube. Uh, it's a lot about gear. Uh, undoubtedly too much, uh, even though there is really good content there. Um, but uh, where you do find people talking about photojournalism is in TED Talks. So if you want to think about ideas about photojournalism, um, see some examples, hear people really exploring the virtues and importance of photojournalism, um, there aren't really YouTube channels, but there are a lot of TED Talks. So that's where you can find that. For the gear, again, I don't want to be too repetitive because you probably have channels you listen to already, but I'll say a few words about it. Um, the first kind of interesting thing to say is that, you know, here in the United States, we had a very contentious presidential election in 2016. And around that election time, I found myself, you know, watching a bunch of political videos and maybe actually not even so much the videos themselves, but more the discussion in the comments. Um, it was not obviously too surprisingly, uh, it was very polarizing, very divisive, very angry, very frustrated, and um, you know, no fun. Um, so at some point I got tired of watching political videos and I switched to watching camera videos. And kind of to my surprise, again, not so much really the videos themselves, but more the discussion in the comments, um, people were just as divisive and angry and bitter about Canon versus Nikon as they were about Clinton versus Trump. So, you know, I don't know if it's just something about the internet or social media or what exactly, but it seems like we can argue about everything. Um, I guess my first really important thought about equipment for you is don't stress out about it. Chill. Um, there are so many great cameras from so many great companies today that whatever you've got is probably good enough. Um, so don't stress, do not go into debt to buy camera gear, work with what you've got and see what you can create. Um, it would be nice if we could say something really sort of extreme, like gear is everything, and if you spend enough money, you will take awesome pictures, or on the other hand, you know, gear is nothing, and if only you find compelling subjects, there will be awesome pictures. And the truth is, it isn't that black or white, it is in between. Gear does matter, better gear does tend to take better pictures, but gear will never be the most important thing. What you put in front of the lens will always matter most. Compelling content will always matter. Fantastic gear pointed at something boring will be a boring picture. So don't obsess too much. It's all, you know, kind of going to work out. Um, I want to, instead of repeating what other people have said, I'm going to link to some videos down below. Uh, there's a, a great filmmaker, Simon Cade. I'm going to link to one of his videos. He's made several videos where he talks about how he will never buy another camera. So he's not a photojournalist, he's a, he's a video filmmaker. But his argument is that we do obsess too much over gear and that while a better camera will give you a little bit better pictures, it's true, um, that there are other things. So for him, not buying cameras and using money to travel or not, you know, a lot of people might buy fancy camera equipment, in, in his case, let's say, to make a narrative film, buy fancy camera equipment, and then ask your friends to be actors for free. He would rather use his old camera equipment and take his money and use that to pay for real actors who will make a real difference. And kind of in his spirit, I have a journalist friend, Ryan Mina. She goes down to the U.S.-Mexico border like every other week to do a series of continuing conversations with people who are, you know, engulfed in our kind of immigration border issues. And, you know, probably those aren't super expensive trips for her, but her ability to be where the story is, is so much more important than whatever gear you might have. I mean, her going there and taking pictures with a phone, you know, we would wish she'd had a nicer camera probably, but, but being where the story is, is what matters. So yes, Better gear is better, 
Um, some cameras do autofocus better and faster than others, but try not to obsess. Try to focus on putting something compelling in front of your camera. And maybe instead of that lens that you don't really need, take a trip and go somewhere that you can see something compelling and cover it. Um, okay, so uh, I should say a little bit about the exposure triangle. Everybody thinks about that. What I'm mostly gonna do is link to another video down below. Sean Tucker made a really great uh, exposure triangle video, so I'm going to let him explain it rather than me repeat that. But I will say, you know, the exposure triangle, just briefly, the three points are the aperture, how much light the lens is letting in, the time, how long you let that light in for, and how sensitive your sensor is. The sensitivity of the sensor generally is mostly just the least noise you can have for whatever your other factors are. But the other two factors are in fact creative factors. Um, the aperture, depth of field, you might want it shallow, you might want it deep. That depends on your situation. So you know, sometimes you wanna shoot wide open, that can be really powerful. Sometimes you wanna see deep focus, that can be powerful. Um, your shutter speed, if you're shooting things that have action or sports, you know, I, I think I shot some, some volleyball from the side and even a two thousandth of a second was too slow to freeze the action. So you can use really fast shutter speeds to freeze action. On the other hand, um, let's say you're shooting a rock concert and you use a really fast shutter speed if you're able to, uh, and you freeze the action, but maybe there's a little bit of a sterility from that, and maybe a slow shutter speed will, instead of seeing a guitarist's hand frozen, you can see the blur of that hand strumming the guitar, and there's a power in that motion blur, and even if the whole image is not quite as sharp, it could be a much more compelling image. Probably the kind of mid-range of exposure times are maybe gonna be the least helpful. So something like a 125th or a 60th might be too slow to be real sharp, but might be too fast to really get motion blur, so it's going to look more like a mistake. Um, if, you go sl if you go fast to really freeze it, okay, or if you really slow it down an eighth of a second, something like that, then it's not gonna look like a mistake. We're gonna clearly see that motion blur and feel that power. So those are some quick thoughts on exposure triangle. I'll link to Sean Tucker and let him tell you the rest of that story. Composition, um, I'm sure you've heard of the rule of thirds. Putting subjects dead center tends to be a little bit less compelling. Booing, going to one third or the other, one third or the other tends to be helpful. These thirds corners are, are really good places. People talk about leading lines where the lines of the road or the lines of the fence or the lines of whatever. Um, can, can help organize your photograph. Often in photojournalism, in street photography, in social documentary, you may not have time for that. You should try to keep it in mind. And in, street photography tends to be very, very spontaneous, at least if you're capturing unexpected things that people do on the street. Photojournalism, you often will have a little bit more time. Um, so think about composition if you can, but sometimes it's just get the shot. Um, backlighting comes up a lot where, uh, so, so if you're out in daylight, if you have good light, any camera, even your phone will do just fine. If the light is not so good because it's indoors or it's evening, or maybe it's outdoors in daylight, but the sun is behind the subject, these are difficult lighting situations. Shooting into backlight could be considered a mistake, but again, sometimes if it's street photography, you may not have the chance is you just see something and you have to catch it. If it's photojournalism, you might be able to move around, but you're not gonna be able to ask the, the live event that you're covering, oh, could you stage it over here instead? That's not obviously journalism. So backlighting is not recommended, but it comes up a lot. Uh, the, the modern sensors are amazing, particularly full frame cameras at really having incredible dynamic range. And if you shoot raw and go into, you know, Lightroom or one of the other applications, you can recover those highlights and those shadows. Um, like backlight, depth of field, some people argue that using shallow depth of field to isolate your subject is a crutch for poor composition, sort of similar to backlight being you know, poor work on your part. But again, 
uh, in many cases, you don't have the opportunity to compose the shot. You don't have the time in street photography. You don't have the editorial control in photojournalism. So sometimes shallow depth of field is the only way you can isolate that subject. If you can recompose, that could be better, but shallow depth of field can be really helpful. Um, Horizon lines, it's kind of funny. These cameras have these little levels on them and all that stuff. I don't really get it. I don't, I don't see what's compelling about a perfectly horizontal horizon line. Uh, Gary Winogrand, an extraordinary photographer, almost never had level horizon lines. In fact, I watched a video where somebody argued that the, the rare occasion when Gary Winogrand's horizon lines were level, those pictures tend to be the boring ones. All of his compelling images have crooked horizon lines. And if you think about it in terms of composition, you know, what does orientation sort of signify? Horizontal is very stable, right? A horizontal, if you take a brick and put it on its side, it's never going to move. Vertical, less stable. You stand a brick on end, it's a little more able to tip over now. Uh, and then diagonal, least stable of all. If you put a brick on an angle, it's in the act of falling. As soon as you let go, bam. Um, but that stability also speaks to dynamic energy. So speaking of the 2016 election, here we are now in our, 20, in our United States 2020 election. And look at pictures of presidential candidates. The traditional way that these things work is that the people who aren't the president who want to be the new president, will use angles. They want that dynamic energy. So they won't be, um, they won't, they won't be vertical or static. They'll be on an angle. So you might see a candidate with their sleeves rolled up, reaching out, shaking somebody's hand. It's this diagonal angle that's indicating action, change, motion. What you have now isn't working. I can do better for you. Uh, by contrast, whoever currently is president and is running for re-election, they won't be using those diagonals anymore because they're now representing their past four-year record. And so the most stable would be horizontal, but you can't have a president laying down. That would be silly. So the next most stable is vertical. And so you tend to see presidential candidates vertically, probably with the American flag, vertically behind them. And so it's a lot of vertical composition, stability. We're on the right track. Let's keep going and then the contender, the outsider, an angle. So, you know, these little kind of simple things of composition can help you compose a frame if you have the time to. Um, but the most important thing, find something compelling, find something important, find some human moment to put in front of your camera and the rest will probably take care of itself. So happy gear week, everyone. Uh, good luck with figuring out your gear and how you want to work. I'll, as I said, I'll put some links below to some other videos that will be helpful. And then next time we'll dive into content week, the obviously really the core. We need the gear to, to make things work, but the content is the point. So good luck with your cameras. Um, see you next time.